I want to discuss something about the structure state space and how do you actually visualize it. First, a definition of our problem. In deterministic chaos, we have state space, some space which we usually think as a d-dimensional vector space, in which each point represents uniquely the state of the system. So that's ingredient number one. And then ingredient number two is the law of how any state changes in time. This law, if you go forward in time, it trace out something I call a trajectory. If you look where it came from, often we can integrate our equations backward in time. And the main thing is that the point x at time zero can be thought of as a label. The real object is the orbit, the totality of states you can reach from a, where you are now and the totality of states that have preceded you. That's called orbit. It's a set, and here are a few simple orbits. Here is an orbit called equilibrium, Q, which has a property that at time t, I'm where I always used to be. In other words, nothing happened. So this seems counterintuitive for somebody interested in dynamics because you know, these are not important states. Nothing happens. There's nothing to describe. It'll turn out that they're totally crucial in our way of organizing the dynamical world. Then the, there could be an orbit that starts here and it ends up here. So what that means, an example of this kind of solution of the dynamical system is death. So you do all kinds of stuff, at some point you quiet down and you don't do anything anymore. You have come, reached the equilibrium point. Another kind of state that can happen is that maybe you start in neighborhood of equilibrium point, not exactly all right because nothing happens, but maybe just close to it. And you go, 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 and you end up someplace else. That turns out to be a very useful notion. It's called heteroclinic. Or sometimes if you start at the same point and come back to the same point, it's called homoclinic orbit. It's this kind of orbits that Poincaré found very crucial in understanding celestial mechanics. Or maybe you start someplace here, you go, you go, you do something, you go, you go, and you come back. That kind of orbit we can also still draw. It's called periodic orbit. And that has a property that no matter where I start on the orbit, so no matter what my initial point is, a period later I'll be back. And this is not true for any point on the orbit. So if you use the time to label, you know, where have we gotten at the 5 minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, after one period everybody's going to come back exactly. And this insight that our ancient to them, the celestial firmament looked like a regular clock. So there are periodic orbits, I can still draw it. And notice one thing that will help us enormously. I want you to be able to navigate 100,000 dimensions, or 20, or 16, or you know, anything larger than 3. So what's good about these orbits? This orbit is a point. A point is a point in 20 dimensions, 100 dimensions, 1000 dimensions. No matter how you look at it, from whichever coordinate frame you construct, it'll be just a point. So you as a human will be able to visualize it, even though it takes 100,000 numbers to specify it. And when I look at the trajectory, the final piece of it, they'll trace out a curve. Now this curve is embedded in 100,000 dimensions, but just one dimensional curve. So no matter how I look at it, you know, I shine light to it, I get a shadow this way, that way, that way, it'll be a line. That means you as a human can visualize this line. This is actually what will make it possible for us to navigate these humongous dimensions. 
the objects that we really track are rather simple. Now the one that has confounded people since 1840s or so, Maxwell was maybe the first person to do this, is that, that unless I'm working this harmonic oscillator or Kepler two-body problem, finding equilibria says that I should look at x dot equals v of x. I'm given my law of motion, says how you know, a thousand components change at every point. And equilibrium is just uh, equal zero. So I have to solve some equation, which is algebraic, doesn't change in time. So that's not so hard to do. It might be hard to make sure that you found them, you know, to prove that you found them. But generically, they tend to be a finite in number. These periodic orbits, however, are really needles in the haystack. It turns out, typically, that you have to specify this 100,000 number with arbitrary precision. 10 to the 11 digits, 10 to 114 digits. And the trajectory, if you can find it, will come back with some error. So they're there. Now, amazing thing, they'll, they'll learn about them, that they're infinitely many of them, and they get harder and harder to do. And now beyond that, there might be other stuff. Objects like that, which are very much what people discovered in early astronomy. They discovered planets move at different frequencies, or they have different periods of rotation. So when you project them on this space, it'll turn out that there'll be a motion, which will be not on a circle like a periodic orbit might be, <coughs> but it will be something that's on a torus. The torus, depending how many things that are circling around almost periodically or periodically, that might be a high-dimensional object, but it has a property that can still draw it. You'll do a simulation, you'll do a computation, it'll be a compact set, it'll be an orbit that you can describe, but it'll be larger than a line. So it might be an area that you have to describe because you have to cover it. But you can still visualize it. So there is a bunch of compact orbits. And by that we mean if you have some kind of meter stick, we can say that periodic orbit is of length 27, and this area is you know, 213 square feet. However, the thing that really happens, and it's totally horrifying, is that for almost any point in a typical a nonlinear system, we have to refine this much as we go along, is that uh, we will go, something will happen, our state space is confined by definition because we'll be interested in systems that um, don't fall apart. We'll be interested in some complicated motion of, let's say, a few planets or turbulent fluid. But I do promise in a later lecture to explore the world. Usually we are looking at something that happens often for a long time, and we will discover when you put your equations on computer, because typically equations you learn how to derive and you learn how to write them down. But to understand their solutions today, you always simulate them on a computer just to get developed intuition. And you'll typically find some horrifyingly complicated thing that never comes back. As we never come back, we will have to develop a notion of neighborhood. If we can show that in an open neighborhood. Now that means I have a ball whose radius is maybe 0.1 in some units, but it's 100,000 dimensional ball because the same volume of the whole space. I'm dividing the whole space into little labs, balls, whatever. If x of t, and let me call this neighborhood m i, so it's a subset of the big state space, and, and if you find out that x of t enters this neighborhood infinitely often for t 
tea larger than some minimal tea. And there could be some shortest return time. You leave the neighborhood, you have to go there, you have to go to Goldman Lab, you have to come back, and then you're allowed to re-enter. So there might be some typical time. But if you can show that you re-enter this neighborhood, then this is called ergodic. And if you can show that this can happen for smaller and smaller neighborhood, uh, the time might be longer and longer because to come close enough. Then you're talking about something that's called ergodic theory. It's a very difficult subject. It's a you know, whole branch of mathematics. And uh, in this course, we call it chaos. Uh, people in other branches of science tend to use this lucid description so we don't have to be called to prove everything rigorously. We just call it chaos, and then we decide what it means as we go along. The problem one faces for anything in dynamics where you have more than two variables, a differential equation in more than two variables. In a plane, it's not a big deal. You can take the introductory nonlinear dynamics course uh, based on book by Strogatz, and all it does is it lives in the plane most of the time. And there's, you know, lots of interesting stuff going on in the plane, but solutions are very simple. And in particular, there are no ergodic solutions in that case. But if you're in three dimensions or more, it is very hard to organize these orbits. And you can think of it this way. In this room, if I had a boomerang, you know, I would throw it in some way, and if I'm very skillful, it'll come close to my hand and I'll catch it. So in three dimensions, you already know that it's rather hard to find a recurrent motion. You know, it requires skill. If you do it a little bit wrong, you know, the trajectory of the boomerang might be quite different. In four dimensions, it's, you know, for all practical reasons, impossible. The higher, higher dimension is, harder is it to come back. Now, in a plane, if I walk across my path, I'm just walking around the same, so it's very simple to find a recurrence in a plane. On, on a line, it's so simple, we don't talk about it, but three, four, five, many, many dimensions, is going to be extremely hard. So it's a nice notion. There's this beautiful mathematical theory. How do we proceed? So first observation is that the moment we have evolution acting on state of space, so something that says things move from a given initial condition, the problem has changed totally, and now what we have is a bowl of spaghetti. What's important for us is to classify what kind of orbits there are. If I can give you a list of possible orbits, then you can say, oh, my point is on this orbit, so it follows this future and has this past. So the real problem in dynamics, and this will be much more uh, apparent by the time we get to the second course in the series, what you want to do is you want to find out what's invariant about dynamics, and what's invariant is when you have an orbit, it's a set of points, it's too easy for equilibrium, for, but for periodic orbit, what happens is that in time, every point moves around the periodic orbit, where the set itself is there. It, it's immutable, it's invariant. 